I appreciate you all being here, and I hope that uh, you've been doing this help so far. Um, I want to make a couple of announcements. Our next program is on May 9th, and that will be Dr. Cliff Buck, who will be talking about something about geochemical uh, tracing and atmospheric deposition and cruises all over the ocean. And so that should be an interesting uh, talk. And so we'll invite you to make sure you're here for that. If I'd also like to suggest that if you are not on our email list already, we have a uh, sign-up sheet up here. If you would just give us your name and email address, we'll add you to our, our list. And if you are not a member of the Associates of Skidaway Institute, we have some newsletters, and which also have some um, uh, little envelopes that will allow you to join the Associates of Skidaway Institute and help support our mission here at the, at the Institute. And we appreciate the support of those that are members as well. So tonight, we're going to be hearing from uh, Catherine Edwards. Uh, uh, Dr. Edwards got a Bachelor of Science in Physics from UNC Chapel Hill, uh, and then a PhD in Physical Oceanography from UNC Chapel Hill. And she started here as an uh, assistant professor in 2013, and she's spent her career so far here and was promoted to associate professor in 2020. So. Dr. Edwards. So I'm so glad to be here and talk to you as part of the evening at Skidaway lecture series. Um, I went back and looked through my talks and found that this is the fifth evening at Skidaway lecture that I've given since in the last several years. Each of them has had separate topics. I haven't been repeating the same talk over and over again. And the next one I give will be different too, because you need fresh content for evening at Skidaway. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking about um, right whale uh, monitoring with autonomous underwater vehicles called gliders today. Um, there's a special guest in the audience today. My mother is here visiting from New Orleans. <laughs> Uh, and it seems especially appropriate, since the topic is right whales, who come down, they also visit Georgia this time of year, to calve, and then the mothers and their babies travel back up uh, to the Gulf of St. St. Lawrence and uh, New England to spend the rest of their year. So it seems appropriate to have a mother and daughter together, <laughs> at, <laughs> at this, especially with Mother's Day coming up. Um, so the title of my talk is Eavesdropping Underwater, Monitoring Right Whales Off of Georgia's Coast Using Autonomous Systems. Um, uh, I gave my name on the first slide, but really this is a representation of, uh, of work from a large group of people who work in my lab. Uh, Karen Drager is my lead glider technician. She's here in the room. Frank McQuarrie is a student in Athens. Uh, James Bird is a master's student at Savannah State and a technician in my lab as well. Um, Garrison Hefner, Ben Hefner, and Drew Hefner are all part-time technicians who help with piloting and in-person activities as well. And I can't leave out some really fundamental members of our lab, uh, the yellow ones that look like torpedoes. <laughs> and they also have names. Uh, their names, our fleet right now is Angus, Franklin, Pelagia, and we have a demo glider named Fodina uh, <laughs> after Modena, the island. <clears throat> um, so they're a big part of our work for sure. Um, but I want to first reintroduce you possibly to the idea of gliders. They are, so I, let me back up and say, I'm a coastal physical oceanographer, and um, a lot of my work deals with trying to understand the physics of the ocean and tie some of those time and length scales from physical processes to um, biological, ecological, geological, and chemical processes in the ocean. One of the tools that I use to do so is an autonomous underwater vehicle called a glider. It moves not with a propeller, but by changing its buoyancy and center of gravity in a super energy efficient way, collecting data passively along the way as it moves up and down. What we do to make that work is 
we have it near neutral at the surface, so it's not sinking, not floating, and it takes in a small volume of water, so then it's heavier than the water around it. And it moves a battery forward on a rail about an inch. That makes it then heavy and pointed down so that gravity moves it down. And the wings on either side give it lift for smooth flight down to the bottom where an altimeter built into the front can detect how close the bottom is. And about 10 feet above the bottom, it reverses the process. It pushes out the water so that it's lighter than the water around it, moves the battery back so that it's pointed up, and then it can't help but float to the surface. Um, <clears throat> and so that process is repeated as the glider flies. In just that back and forth motion, the glider has flown a football field, maybe longer, depending on how deep of how deep the water is. And it's just two small motions that make that happen. About every four to six hours, we have them come up to the surface. It inflates a little bladder in its tail section, so it sticks its behind out of the water so that a built-in satellite phone can get good sky view and communicate some of the data that it's been collecting over that zigzag seesaw pattern through the ocean over the last four to six hours. It typically stays connected for about eight to 15 minutes or so, sending a subset of the data we've collected. And that's our opportunity to interact with it. Based on the data that we see coming in or from satellite or other data sources, we might be able to adapt its motion and change where it's going in its future leg. Or we might just say, you just keep on being you. <laughs> and stay safe, my friend. I'm going back to sleep because it's 4 in the morning. <laughs> but these are incredibly, um, incredibly efficient um, uh, instruments. They can remain deployed for four to six weeks at a time on our shelf, completely untethered, flying on their own, talking to, to me and the group I showed you in the second slide. Um, or if we use lithium batteries, depending on the sensors that are installed, the gliders can be out for up to six months on one battery charge. So they're amazing tools, and they're not just cool robots. They actually do some science. Um, we have them packed with sensors. Um, there's a temperature salinity sensor on the side that measures temperature, conductivity, and depth from which we can understand the salinity and density. Um, you can put an oxygen sensor on the tail. There are fluorometers that measure chlorophyll, colored dissolved organic matter, and uh, backscatter. Um, and then there are auxiliary sensors that you can use to measure currents. And what we're going to talk about today is the integration of acoustics onto these platforms. They are really appealing as an acoustic platform because since they don't have propellers on the back like a lot of other robotic vehicles, they're relatively quiet. So as it's smoothly gliding, it can be listening with ears to, or acoustic uh, hydrophone ears, on the way down. Um, so the, the gliders are really only limited by the amount of space, the amount of power, and some ingenuity to miniaturize the sensors and include them on the glider. So in prior years, I've talked about how we've used hurricanes to understand and better predict hurricanes and their magnitude as they've come close to the Georgia coast. More recently, um, we've integrated autonomous surface vessel vehicles into the fleet and had them coordinate with our gliders so we can get information about the heat content in the ocean and how fast it may be moving into the atmosphere. Um, I think last time I talked about some exciting artificial intelligence work we're doing in the area of acoustic telemetry in Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, uh, where we're using gliders to adaptively sample hot spots in Gray's Reef. And today we're going to talk about um, a new area of acoustics our lab has moved in, largely inspired by some of the acoustic modeling we did in the prior project. So we'll talk today about right whale monitoring. And as I said before, I am a physical oceanographer. My degree is in physics. I kind of have a one leg in engineering through all of this cool stuff we do with gliders and other instruments. So I have a fantastic collaborator at the University of South Carolina, um, a marine conservation, conservationist named Aaron Meyer Gutbrod, 
who is my co-PI on this project, and her smart and fabulous graduate students, Abby Kruiser and Ahmedi Safa Twerfor. Um, so you'll see their pictures in here, and I hope to do their, them justice uh, with questions about whales. So a bit of an introduction to the right whales. They spend um, a good bit of their life up in New England and in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where they eat a whole bunch of zooplankton, they get fat, and then um, they'd have a, an annual migration down to a calving area off of Georgia and Florida here, the Southeast Wintering Grounds um, off of our coast. Um, that migration typically begins in uh, November, um, and then they arrive in our area starting around December, making their way um, past, uh, past all of our coastal states. Um, they are, they used to be known as the, as the saying went, as the right whale because they were the right one to shoot um, because of their high, high oil content and also because high fat content and also because the fact that these are, these are pokey little puppies of the glider, of the, of the whale world. Um, they only move at about three to four miles an hour through the water as they swim around. They're not scooting around. Um, so unfortunately, that makes them easy to catch and to kill. So these are species that, despite 90 years of conservation efforts, remain critically endangered um, and are classified as such. Um, this is an old graphic, and I know it's old because it says there are 400 of them left in the world. 400. And I know it's old because that number is down by 25%. Um, there are now fewer than 340 individuals left, um, as best as I could find. Um, and there's um, a number of things that, 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 that cause their endangerment. But first, let's focus on some happy stuff. <clears throat> We're going to have a little bit of a downer slide or two. So let's have a happy one. Um, they come down to us to to calve, birth their young, and raise them to adulthood before they run the gauntlet back up to uh, New England. And that is one of the first calves spotted off of Georgia's coast. Um, they named him Smoke, I believe. Um, if you look through science Twitter, there are fabulous accounts from Georgia DNR, from NOAA Fisheries. Um, and if you go to Noah's, NOAA Fisheries website, there is actually a description of each calf that is born um, who its mother is. Um, often they talk about this is the great grand calf of, of, a very, of, of an older individual. So there's genealogies of these animals as well. That's what happens when you're down to 340 of you. Um, but this is a particularly precious video that was posted to Twitter. This was off of Georgia's coast. This was taken by Georgia DNR, one of the first calves with his mama, um, <clears throat> swimming around. This is taken from an aerial or drone survey, I believe. Um, and, you know, look at me frolicking, snuggling, swimming around. No idea what it's about to get into. Um, but it's a wonderful set of follows to look at the NOAA website, see how these individuals are tracked, um, and then see, I know, right? <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Totally ridiculous. So this is the happy part, right? So here's the problem, <clears throat> is that population growth is determined by the number of births you have minus the number of deaths. And unfortunately, right whales are not reproducing fast enough to replace the ones who die every year. So their population continues to decline. So this image here on the left, I'll see if I can get, oh, there it is, okay. <clears throat> um, shows the births in the blue, the deaths in the red, and there are patterns where there are great years for births and not so great years for births. We have been in an unexpected, what's called an unexpected mortality event since 2017, in which the number of deaths has far outstripped the number of live births per year. 
Um, and you can see a bit of a longer history over over just 30 years, how the species was actually doing great. It was improving, um, doing a lot better, and then a sharp decline starting in uh, 2014, continuing through today. So what leads to this sharp decline? Here's another, another view of that. Um, so there have only been 42 calves born since 2017. You can add another, I think, 10 or 12 to that count based on what I read uh, from this year so far. Um, um, only about a third of right whale deaths are actually documented. Um, so we know there are individuals that are getting missed in these counts. Um, but in addition to the deaths that, that we can count up at, because of because of carcasses, um, there are all sorts of um, near mortal injuries, serious injuries that whales get as they're running the gauntlet between their, their, their summer homes uh, in New England to their winter homes in Florida and Georgia. Um, there are, out of these 50 known dead or serious injuries, it breaks down to 34 known dead, um, about a third of those from vessel strikes, another third from entanglements, another third completely unknown. Um, and then serious injuries as well that are about a third of that total of, one, one of, of 50. So where do these anthropogenic mortalities come from? Uh, one of the primary ways, particularly in our neck of the woods, is ship strikes. Um, it was the cause of death uh, in 53% of necropsies performed over a, what is that, a 36-year period. Um, and um, it, it's, it's the, you, it, the ones who survive, you, you can often see scarring from propellers and other incidents uh, with vessels of small sizes, large sizes, everything in between. As I said earlier, these are the pokey little puppies. So it's, it's easy to uh, run them over if you're going fast in the water where they live. Um, fishing gear entanglement is another, um, <clears throat> another major component of um, mortality. Um, it occurred in 83% of the population. Um, there is a lot of active work being done to entangle. When, when a whale is reported sighted as entangled, then um, there are a lot of active efforts to find that and free that way the animal as fast as possible. Um, not all entanglement events are mortal. Um, no, but new, entangle event, new entanglement events occur annually in about a quarter of the population. So, you know, that's 85 animals getting entangled with fishing gear every year. Um, and then um, a related but also important to know variability is um, a climate-driven prey availability. Uh, circulation, uh, 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 connection. Um, the right whale's primary feeding source is through copepods, um, and there have been some shifts in copepod abundance um, that are related to climate signals, um, regime shifts in this prey abundance. Um, you know, there are a lot of things we can do. Let's go take care of entanglements, right? Let's, let's do that. Let's go take care of ship strikes. There are policy changes we can make about ship strikes. It's a little bit harder to think about policy-driven solutions for prey abundance, right? But, you know, some of these things are related. Animals are moving toward, maybe moving toward more populous or more busy, busier places because they need to work harder to forage for food. So it's not, it's not easy to untangle all of these effects from each other. So one of the primary ways to deal with this problem, particularly the ship strike issue, it was through the creation of NOAA dynamic management areas. There's a large dynamic management area uh, in uh, stretching from New York up through New England. Um, and these are triggered by visual sightings. If an animal is spotted, that detection goes out. Um, and there are, in general, right whale slow zones triggered by these, these uh, visual and acoustic detections for vessels over 65 feet. Um, so then they are known to, they must avoid the area or slow down to 10 knots. Um, so these dynamic management areas are voluntary at this point, um, but there's a proposed rule to elevate this DMA to mandatory status that's under consideration right now. 
Um, and that might also expand vessel speed, the speed limits to uh, vessels of size 35 feet and larger as well. Um, we're, we also have these school zones or whale zones, slow zones off of Georgia, um, but they re rely on sufficient visual monitoring. And you just can't get eyes on these animals all the time. Um, they spend their lives underwater, right? <clears throat> um, and looking where we are off of Georgia, we have the fourth busiest port in the United States with traffic just zooming back and forth. You can think of each of these ports along the US coast having channels that extend right across this migration corridor. The Port of Charleston also has heavy port traffic with 2.6 million TEUs a year. Um, and um, so how do we do in Georgia uh, with compliance with these, with these uh, suggested speed limits? Well, I'll blow that up for you. Um, Charleston has a 9.3% compliance of vessels coming into the port. And Savannah has 9.42% compliance coming in. So um, better believe if these rules become mandatory, there's, there's, there's a lot of discussion about how that would take effect, how it gets, um, how it gets enforced, um, and how to measure its effectiveness. Um, but you have to have, you have to, it, it helps to actually have the sightings to see the animals. Maybe if you had a way to see the animals and report that you saw one or heard one, then it would be a little bit easier to ask the vessels to slow down. You know, they're trying to get under the bridge in time, right? To get to Garden City to unload their gear and then all of the logistics that come from there, they're not focused, they're not rewarded based on how slow they go through this speed zone. Um, but, for example, you drive through, you might drive through the uh, school zone for Hess Elementary School, <clears throat> right? <laughs> you, you, might, you might have been going over 35 once or twice or over the, over the school zone, 25 over the school zone limit. If you see children on the sidewalk, are you going to slow down? Right? Oh, absolutely. So are these kinds of policy solutions, what can we do to have more of these detections available so that some of these suggested or mandatory speed limits get taken seriously? So this is where passive acoustics may come in handy. Um, sound travels long distances in water. Um, sound in water travels as a wave of compression uh, which means um, which means it travels faster, about five times faster than, than the speed of sound in air. But it also means that, especially at low frequencies, there's, there's less attenuation of the signal. So particularly low frequency signals can travel for very, very long distances underwater. Um, and you might have heard, let's see, the mouse isn't visible on my screen, so I have to do it this way. Oh, wait, I saw it come back. Come on. There you go. Come on. Oh, it's not going. Oh, it's not going. Ooh. <clears throat> um. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I introduced with, we started off with gliders and then we went to the right whales in peril. How can we use gliders to monitor for real time, uh, near real time monitoring of endangered right whales? So the idea is we can build in passive acoustic hydrophones or essentially microphones that listen underwater that can listen particularly for these low frequency signals that travel long distances. And when the glider, not just measure it and, and store it, but when the glider comes up next, just a few hours later, it can report that sound to shore so that it can be one of these sightings that goes, um, that, that can trigger a slow zone. Um, so um, there's a built-in component to these hydrophones that has a library of whale calls in it. So that for each species, there might be up calls and calls with different signatures in both frequency space where the pitch elevates or it dips, but it also occurs over a given time and even again, given frequency range. 
So as these instruments listen, if there's a signal that matches it, it goes, that's it, and can send it back to shore. So, you know, perhaps we can take this idea of low compliance and think about gliders as a tool that can patrol north or south or all the time uh, off of Charleston and, and Savannah near the ports and be able to provide even more valuable support so that the glider measures whales that have different signals and frequency space and that data can be shared in real time with whale alert. Um, that can be distributed passively to people who are interested and need to know the information. So, a note about whales. And a note, if you take down any of these websites to use, be very, very careful about the extension that you use with it. Because, <laughs> I know, now, <laughs> now you're, you're like, oh no, I don't know if I want to know this. But this is the whale. <clears throat> But so are these. <laughs> a whale, just like a gambling term, being a big fish and a, going into a casino, um, is also a more modern term for thinking about day traders taking high risk, making high risk trading uh, on their own. So <laughs> yeah, so unfortunately, um, so use care when downloading apps. The first row is what you get by going to whale alert. Uh, the one on the left is right whale alert. The one on the right is <clears throat> day trading <laughs> data providers. The one on the bottom is whale map, um, which provides latest real-time uh, right whale detections. Uh, the one on the right is more blockchain data and trading. So yes, no. <laughs> So the goal of this project, um, we got some funding through uh, a nonprofit organization called the Tides Foundation. Um, this, you know, most of my funding comes through the National Science Foundation, through the Office of Naval Research, through NOAA, and other groups. Um, and Aaron and I were really glad to be able to get the attention of the nonprofit group, the Tides Foundation. And what we proposed, and, and they funded us to do, is integrate and test this technology in our gliders, um, uh, in, in the Skidaway glider named Angus. Uh, and the goal was to have the initial deployment this year, which we did in 2023 off of Georgia during calving season. Um, and we wanted to validate the use of the equipment on mobile uh, instruments, but also develop best practices. Because you can take a hydrophone that you might moor in a, central, in a central location at the bottom and just have it listen, you don't have to worry about it moving around, right? So we want to compare those stationary results to the mobile results and also think about the best ways to fly our gliders to collect the best data possible. And then as we develop our program, we want to look for temporal and spatial changes in calving ground use. Are they coming back to the same places? Are there some places that are more popular than others? What is the water depth range where they spend their time and trigger this dynamic vessel management in near real time, particularly for the ports of Savannah, Charleston, and maybe expand uh, geographically? So um, I mentioned the artificial intelligence uh, ooh, comes in. Um, it gets translated into this spectrograph, uh, spectrogram that has frequency on the, um, on the y-axis here where low frequency signals like whale are here closer to the bottom. And this is over time. And these are the characteristic sounds of whales. What gets sent back to the glider is a major subset of all of that information where it just picks out the changes. And that subset of information is what gets sent back to shore for the student analysts at University of South Carolina to say, yep, that is indeed a whale, that, or that, that is a true detection, not a false detection. Then those data get shared automatically with the collaborator Mark Baumgartner at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, who runs a website called Robots for Whales, no weird day trading stuff with this website, I promise you. Um, and so he runs a network of gliders in um, the Gulf of Maine, but also has been working with us. He's also installed a series of buoys that 
perform much in the same way. And we put one in off of Georgia this year on the RV Savannah, uh, our ship. Um, and it fulfills much of the same purchase, purpose. It stays in the same place and it listens and then it uses AI to trigger a detection and that's shared in real time. And you can watch Robots for Whales and see the network from Georgia, we are the southernmost leg, all the way up to the Canadian border and beyond. So we had a fabulous time integrating the instruments. Um, the, the black portion here is, um, is the acoustic hydrophone that has its, um, its microphone end sticking out of the top. Um, this was our unboxing, so we had to, <laughs> we had to do that. We didn't, we didn't do an Instagram story with it. But, um, <clears throat> uh, and this is it. Uh, mounted on Angus the glider. Uh, and this was when we deployed off of, um, off of a charter vessel, and this is it going off of the side. So over its 15-day mission in February, um, it moved around near Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. We, uh, I'll show you some moored hydrophones that we put in uh, for ground truthing. Um, so we decided to stay within that area and try to sneak a little bit on the inshore side and see how far we could safely operate. We experimented with these modes of motion where we could, you know, there's not a lot of moving parts on a glider, but what if we stop moving those, right? Um, could that make us get, help us get better hydrophone data? Um, and then lastly, um, we had eight detections over this, over this uh, 15 day period. Each of those dots is a right whale detection off of our area. We don't know. We don't know. I don't know if they have accents or what. Um, <laughs> that would be a lovely thing to, to look at. Um, but the right whale isn't the only whale this, this, um, this software looks for. It also has a library with say whales, fin whales, right whales, and humpback whales. Um, and so the data come back. There's sort of a, a live stoplight chart of when you get detections. And they go through. You can see which days Erin was looking at the spectrograms herself. Um, and you can see the yellow is what type of whale was detected and which days. Um, we can see them, put them on a map, and see where they were as well. On whalemap.org, <clears throat> um, you can see how these measurements fit in with a larger observing strategy, um, where the, um, the, the lines here represent aerial surveys um, <clears throat> that are done by planes. Um, and then the, the red, I'm sorry, is the critical habitat zone. The gliders are shown here. Um, and each of the observations is shown as a dot, the ones that are confirmed visual or acoustic, uh, acoustic uh, detections. And we can put our map of eight days with detections together with the days that uh, there were visual surveys, visual detections, and see that we are, um, we are seeing animals that complement this visual detection that requires people to go out on planes and try and, and fly along these lawnmower tracks all the way up and down the coast. There is never going to be enough coverage for those airplanes to see everything. And so having instruments in the water listening for the sounds that whales make uh, fills in additional information. So this is, sorry, I forgot to blow, this is the blow up of that slide, so you don't have to squint anymore. Um, <clears throat> so you can see the, the, the paths of the aerial surveys. Um, and think about the human hours it takes to do those on a repeat basis, how it requires good weather to be able to do that. Um, and so having autonomous detections from technologies that can be in the water all the time, regardless of the weather on top, is a pretty valuable thing. So our next steps now are to ground truth the mobile data. You know, you go out and you do all the science and then you bring all the data home. And the one thing that gliders do is they provide a fire hose of data uh, from the sensors on the, on the glider, but then you've got hours of recording uh, from the passive acoustic hydrophones. Um, we also put out at the same time, the South Carolina group led this effort to build moorings. Um, these are tires 
filled with concrete <laughs> and um, they got to play in the machine shop and um, more hydrophones called sound traps to the side of them. And so those sit in the water and, and listen. Um, we put them in three places, one at the 15 meter isobath, one in water that's 20 meters deep, and then the last one in 22 meters deep, all near Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. And the point of this is to validate what we hear on the glider. Do you hear it when the glider is nearby the 20 meter mooring? Do you hear it at the 15 meter mooring when the glider's all the way over here? When can all three moorings hear the same signal? Because that gives us a clue of how close you have to be to an animal to detect it if they hear the same thing. It might also give us information about how far the animal is away that you hear, and you might be able to leverage that information as well. So here's the other complication. Gliders move by changing their buoyancy and center of gravity, right? So every time you go there, and the reason they're energy efficient is because you go, and then you move forward a long way, and then and then you move forward another long way as you go up. If you're in really shallow water, you're moving all the time and you lose all of that efficiency you get by simply falling and flying with gravity or falling up uh, with buoyancy. <clears throat> so we get way reduced, um, reduced uh, battery lifetime of our gliders in shallow water. It also makes them fly like bread trucks um, because they don't get enough speed to be maneuverable. So our typical line of glider operations, where we like to do glider operations, is typically offshore of the 20-meter isobath. Um, Karen might say 30 is even better. Um, <clears throat> but how do, we, how do we reconcile that with the migration corridor typically being at the 20-meter isobath and inshore? These animals are largely more confined to the shore then our gliders can sample all of the time. So understanding what the effective range of these hydrophones is, is pretty important to understanding the data we collect with it. And it's really important, therefore, to have some of these inshore moorings to be able to ground truth and understand, potentially, how far away the animals are. Another important question is what factors drive the changes in detection range? You know, uh, on the fisheries talk I gave last time, um, I talked about a work, some work that my graduate student, Frank McQuarrie, is doing where he's modeling sound speed changes that based on changes in temperature, salinity, and depth in the water. And how that can change is how, how that changes, how far away you hear fish that are tagged in Gray's Reef. Can we use that same approach and think about what's the detection range that we hear based on the data that's coming in from the glider. And then lastly, how do we use this knowledge to our advantage to better sample and provide better data, detection data? So um, the, the, the next little sort of, we knew this was coming, but part of the reason it's helpful to be in a little bit deeper water is that each of those motors moving for the glider to go up and glider to go down, create some self noise. And I started off by talking about gliders being a, 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 a silent platform. And they're not so silent, except if this sound doesn't play, then they're definitely silent. And I'm not as good at making these noise, but it's, 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 it's large noises. This is the sound in spectral, spectral space, where on the y-axis is the frequency, and then this is time moving. Each of those greens is a component of the glider moving. And the signal of the whales, we think, is going to be down here in this range. When the glider is moving, how effectively can we hear? If it's, when if it's moving its internal parts, how effectively can we hear the whales? And this is another really important part that we're doing in our analysis, post-deployment analysis, to better understand how best to use these gliders, in, particularly in shallow water. So our next steps are analysis of the passive acoustics from gliders and moorings. Um, we want to examine strategies for, to ameliorate glider self-noise. Um, our next deployment will be in December 2023, and we are hoping to attract more funding to continue these efforts uh, through the season. 
Um, the whales are typically down here from, you know, November, December through about now is when they're mostly leaving out. Um, but even how, how long animals are here and what, where they are at any given time is really difficult to tell, particularly because the coverage in many of these maps is really, really low south of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Um, so then the last of the next steps is things like this, getting the word out. Here are things. I mean, you can't do anything unless you know there's a whale in the water, right? So um, right now, the best of our ability is to have a passive, uh, a passive transfer of knowledge that you can go to a website, you can have here are the whales. Uh, the next step is to push that, uh, those detections out to vessels offshore um, and then work with uh, work with places like the ports and logistics companies to uh, see if they can incorporate some of this knowledge into their logistics. MyWhaleMap.org of the future would have not just one glider off of Georgia. Um, you know, we've started off by thinking if we flew a glider just north of the port of Savannah, we could hear the migration. We could hear the first whales coming past the area just north of Georgia and give a heads up to the port and say, first, we're hearing the first one. Okay, trigger the dynamic speed limit laws. Um, then what do you do? Do you move it south, try to follow a migration? Do you try to follow individuals? How do you provide the coverage to know how many animals they are and what's their actual range beyond the surveys? So I would love to see a combination of gliders. Um, Dozens of them off of a dozen of them off of the coast during my uh, during the calving season, where they can both monitor the migration moving south and then back north, and monitor their uh, their movements when they're calving off of our coast. Ultimately, what we want to do is compare mobile and moored assets, uh, assets develop best practices, trigger these dynamic speed zones, um, and assess some of these presence and seasonality issues to guide wind farm planning uh, down the, in the future. This is not a concern right now off of Georgia's coast, but there are lease blocks um, that have been, um, have been bid on off of South Carolina. Um, uh, and so there's a growing discussion about how to best, how to best integrate these surveys into planning and um, and, and action for these sites. All they need, they don't need one more thing, right, to deal with as they run the gauntlet. Another concept championed by our collaborator, Mark Baumgartner, is this idea of ropeless fishing, sort of building in some of these robots into the whole shebang, so that instead of having every lobster pot connected to the surface with a float, providing all sorts of all sorts of line for animals to swim through and get entangled in. Um, these, these would be on-call lobster buoys that are connected through um, basically acoustic releases so that the fishermen could come back to the site, put uh, an acoustic uh, instrument down into the water that sends a signal to the buoy to release. And it could then come up to the surface without having a surface signature there to entangle animals. Um, and this kind of capability is made possible uh, through, through first starting with knowledge of how big the problem is. So, <clears throat> um, and this is just a highlight of my student Frank's work that you can take the temperature, salinity, and, and pressure from the glider, calculate sound speed profiles, and understand how far away a an animal can be detected for acoustic telemetry. So we'd very much, and we've, we've, this is validation data down here, um, that shows that we do pretty well at predicting how far away you can hear an instrument from a raise there. We'd like to repeat these same experiments at lower frequencies and see if they may be applicable for whales. And then, of course, the, 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 my dream of the ropeless fishing, my version of it, is with integrated robotic networks of gliders, where those, those 16 gliders that I put from North Carolina to the Florida border are all integrated not just with shore, but with each other, so that they can use knowledge that one gains and use it collaboratively to move around the fleet. 
so that you might be able to use this loop of artificial intelligence where you, you optimize the fleet spacing based on what you hear and how far away you think you can hear an animal. If there's a cluster of detections, should you, should you have a big cluster of instruments there or do you want to fan out if you're reliably certain that you can hear long distances? And then, oh, there we go. So that's my, that's my grand dream of a vision of the future of whales frolicking happily, um, a ropeless fishing. They just, they just make their trip down. Ships slow down in front of them and say, no, you first. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it's really hard to go from science to policy. And I'm glad that's not my job. Um, because that's a lot harder. I can go out and collect my data, make my arguments, show the data. This is the evidence for what I found. And then uh, the policy solutions are harder to think about and they're harder to take action on. Um, so I want to acknowledge the funding for this through the Tides Foundation. Um, as I mentioned, we're hoping to expand this work. You too could sponsor a glider mission. A little bigger than an, what can fit in an envelope, but um, I think this is something a lot of people are very passionate about, passionate about um, and it's something that we'd very much like to expand. It's a special part of our area to be part of this ecosystem. Um, data support is provided through Sakura, and then Mark Baumgartner helps transmit our data to the Robots for Whales site where it can be viewed and is passed on to networks. So I want to thank you for your time and attention and take questions as well. Of course. I love your passion. <laughs> um, I love your passion. I can tell this is your, your baby. Do you have um, visions to have gliders all the way up to Massachusetts, to Canada, I mean, maybe the whole coast, so that that information can be, you know, as soon as they're starting to migrate down, oh, here they come, here they come, here they come. Wouldn't that be? Oh, wouldn't that be a dream? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And think of all the cool things you could do and all the data that comes in. Because, you know, the right whales aren't the only cool thing that's happening in the ocean between here and there. Um, you know, we have networks of weather stations and towers. And, like, you know, my father loves having a weather station on his house, even though there's one just a few blocks away, um, because location matters, right? So, um, but we don't have that analog in the ocean. We don't have data avail availability at high, um, at, high, um, at high spatial frequency uh, in the ocean. It's harder to do. Um, salt is corrosive. Um, power budgets get changed because you've got to deal with things being underwater and then you get eaten by a turtle. Um, all kinds of things happen out there. It gets weird quick, y'all. Um, and so autonomous underwater vehicles are a great option for, for being able to expand the net and uh, among, along with other remote sensing things. It's not gonna replace ships and aerial surveys and satellites and stuff, but there's a lot more than right whales that can happen with this. And so I would love a network that does all kinds of stuff. Um, you get these repeat surveys that help us understand about the hurricanes and about fisheries acoustics and about right whales and about the physical oceanography and about the zooplankton blooms and how and when they're triggered and how that varies spatially. I mean, it's, right whales are a small part of it, but they're the part that for many people is more compelling than, say, Gulf Stream frontal eddy meandering. <laughs> yes? Um, the question is sort of, for the whales, there's only 340. Why can't they be tagged and and monitored from satellite, but like other animals? Right. Yeah, we put them on tur. We put satellite tags on turtles. We put yeah. them on all kinds of. I mean, seals. We even put tags on them so that they measure temperature for us as they dive, uh -huh. and then we build that data into models. I mean, we we put some animals to work. Um, the calculus on whether or not to tag some of these animals is a bit complex because of their significant endangerment. So, you know, if you tag an animal, what's the likelihood of causing an infection? Um, and that risk, though small, may outweigh the benefit of being able to see more of them because these are such critically endangered species. So that's my understanding of the choice now is that you can, but should you? Right? 
Um, and maybe if their, their population rebounds enough, then that's something that would be a little bit easier to, to think about testing and showing explicitly. Yes? Do, do the right whales travel in pods, or are they very individual in there? Uh, best of my understanding is that it's a combination. I mean, whales, like people, are individuals. Um, and um, some, um, some nursing mothers travel with an ant. Um, it's not in right whales, and then um, I've seen it with uh, blue whales off of uh, Hawaii and stuff as well. So that's not unusual. Um, you know, but um, fairly recently, there was an individual found by an individual baby found by himself uh, near Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, was that because, you know, his mother was hurt or endangered or killed or, you know, uh, wounded along the way? Did he get lost? Was somebody stranded or beached or, or things like that? Um, I don't think they travel as, you know, like, hey, guys, get on the bus. We're all going down. <laughs> um, and, and that's based on sightings that if you go to the the... The, it's like at a birth announcement page. It's wonderful. It's each whale as it's born and a picture of it and like its name, what its tag numbers are, what it's, what it's, what it's um, not, the, not the satellite tags, but a, a, a passive tag uh, is. Um, and, you know, those are great. But I think they're, they're a bit more staggered um, as they make their migration. Um, and then along the way, there's a million other things that happen to them that might separate them further. When these gliders are going up and down, what happens if they hit a whale? I would blame it on the whale. <laughs> the gliders move pretty slowly, too. I mean, if, if whales are pokey little puppies, then, then gliders are slugs. Um, they move at 25 centimeters a second, um, which is about a walking pace. So they move even more slowly than the whales. And if they make enough mo they make enough noise with all of this ee, ee, moving stuff back and forth that they certainly can be heard by other animals. How other animals interact or do what they do with that information is a little unclear. Hello, Catherine. Yes. We've got one more question here. Is there We've got a couple online too. So go ahead and answer the question there and we'll uh, ask some from online. Excellent. Good. The whales are often injured by ships. Aren't the gliders sometimes injured by ships? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and that's part of why we have them spend as little time at the surface as we can get away with. We send a very small subset of the data because sending data via satellite is very expensive. Um, uh, but only bad things happen when you're at the surface. Other than <laughs> you are vulnerable to a ship coming on to you. Um, we've, had, we've had collaborators who suddenly their, suddenly their glider starts moving at about 15 knots to the nearest port <laughs> in a straight line, not realizing that it's connected to satellite and can talk to us. Um, so there's both the friendly fishermen going like, oh my gosh, I'm going to help and bring it back. And a little bit of a like, sweet, I'm going to put it in my backyard kind of a thing. <laughs> a little bit of both. But then also vessel strikes. Um, our biggest endangerment at the surface in terms of strikes are actually from sharks lately, um, where they sit at the surface. They're about six feet long, look like a nice, tasty tuna. Uh, and from below, sharks are, are visual predators. They strike. They see this thing, and they go, and they get a nasty surprise. Um, unfortunately, so do we sometimes. We've recovered them with major damage to their exterior, sometimes their interior, and dental material left behind, and at least a few. And then there are a couple that we've just never heard back from, and we think this is what happened, that they were struck by a shark that flooded the instrument, and that was that. Questions from online? Yes, uh, we have a question from Amanda Meadows. How far away are we from detecting the movement and speed of the pods of the whales using autonomous systems? How far away are we from detecting the, the movement of the pods using these autonomous systems? Do I have that correct? Correct. OK. Um, I think we need many more of these experiments to tell. I think, um, I think we put one in off of here. We have challenges. We're not the, let me back up. 
Um, we're not the first glider to go in with a hydrophone in uh, with this technology that's been developed and tested by our collaborators at Woods Hole. But the water where we're operating is significantly more shallow. And so the questions about acoustic range and detection range are real and unknown. Um, shallow water is noisier. There's all sorts of stuff happening. Um, so I think there's a lot of engineering work to be done to see how you can potentially build these networks with the goal of understanding where the pods are. Um, I would love the idea of following a migration, right? Where you can, if I'm hearing you, I'm following you, right? <laughs> I'm just going to follow Marco Polo my way from, from New England down to Florida and see how far I can get with, with that. Um, you know, it may be that we can put that information together with the visual detection surveys or, the, um, or some of the, the vessel, vice vessel sightings um, to be able to see, okay, well, this is what we heard. This is what we saw at the same time. You know, how many things are we, are, are we seeing an individual? And we're not at that point yet with just sound. Thank you. One, one last one, and I apologize. This is a policy question. Uh -oh. uh, are, there, are there legal consequences for ships that strikes, strike whales as the right whales cross this migration path or as they cross the migration path? Is there any um, legal consequence for that? So is there a legal consequence if you strike, uh, if you strike a right whale? I'm not aware of any legal consequences. Um, I highly doubt that a lot of the vessels who hit right whales are even aware that it happened. You know, it's, it's um, <clears throat> the animals are large, but they move slow. And, you know, a bazillion TEO, TEU uh, container ship coming into the port is even larger. And, and I bet it doesn't even, it, it doesn't even make a, uh, doesn't even strike at all uh, to, to people on board. So, you know, I'm not sure how much of that is possible. Um, you know, you are, boaters on the water are asked to report right whales that you see. Having whale map on your, the whale alert on your phone is one way to do that. You can do that from offshore, download it onto your phone, um, make your report, and then when you get back into cell range, it can, it can be added to the map. We've been out on the RV Savannah where there have been right whale sighted. It's not very common, not as common as we would like, um, but those are then called in over radio as well. And all vessels are supposed to be doing this. Um, how much they do it is, is, isn't clear. When your gliders are out there for weeks or months, how do you call them home? <laughs> Angus, come <laughs> here. <laughs> when we interact with the glider, when it comes in, um, it says, hi, my name is Angus. This is my GPS position. Um, this is how long ago my GPS position was. This is what I'm doing. And that's your chance to interact with the glider. So we can say, go to this waypoint or run this series of waypoints or give more complicated instructions. Um, and then um, the way our recoveries work is we fly it into an easy recovery spot we work with a charter or our fabulous research vessel, Savannah, or the Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary partners who've provided us a lot of vessel support. And we say, basically, meet you at Gray's Reef. I'll see you there. Um, and they reliably come up. We have an operator on shore talking to, the, talking to the glider and talking with the vessel and guiding it in. Yes. What exactly is going on in this? Okay. <laughs> Usually somebody asks if I would. That is really a turtle head. And that is, you know, a glider is, is about 10 inches in diameter. So that's a ginormous turtle, right? So that's his mouth or like... <laughs> That's his head coming up. And yes, his head He's is that big. He's just checking it out. He's, He's that, well, so we were doing research off of Long Bay, South Carolina on the RV Savannah. We had the gliders out flying, and this one was kind of not going where it was supposed to. It was going a little more slowly and not calling in very frequently. We had a wildlife photographer on board with one of these lenses like this, and he was saying, well, there it is, but it's got something dark on it. <laughs> oh, now it's on the side of it. Oh, now it's not there. Now it's below it. Now it's, no, oh, it's back. It was a four foot, the shell length of this loggerhead turtle was four feet long. Whoa. 
And there were bite marks all over the suit of the tiger. <laughs> there were chew marks on, on, on the, the, the back. We, could, we have pictures of it pulling the power cord out. That's why it's that the green is sticking out like that. Um, it was mating season for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked with the turtle center and they said that was the most likely. I know, right? A hybrid. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> that is amazing photograph. I know. I love it. I love it. He was huge. And, and you know, here's this 93-foot vessel. We come right on it. And he's like, no, I'm staying with my girlfriend. <laughs> and, and then it puts in a rib. It's a, what, 12 or 13-foot rib that goes in. And they less, lowers in on a crane, and people get in and up to it. And he's like, OK, fine. You can have her. Uh, but I mean, we were, pretty much had to beat him away. <laughs> yes. So when there's damage and you have to go retrieve it, do you have something you can put in its place? It, you only named four gliders. That's an excellent question. Um, I have a friend who has a rule of thumb that for every glider that you use, that you need one more as a spare for something that happens to it. Um, we don't have enough gliders yet. so. Um, if you would like to help out with that, <laughs> we would be happy, happy to name it whatever you would like to suggest. Um, but we really would like to, to build up the fleet. Um, and part of the reason there was this mission was cut short at only 15 days was because the buoyancy pump failed 15 days into mission. And so the glider was no longer operable. This is a brand new hardware component. We just about cried. Um, and so we had no choice but to recover the instrument. And unfortunately, it could not be repaired by the company in time to redeploy as we had hoped, which is why we're deploying in, 2020, in December 2023 instead of having a glider out right now. I was really excited because the idea of having a glider out right now and going like, ding, 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 it's here, <clears throat> would have been fun. It would have been tight for another project. I see Karen cutting eyes at me. <laughs> um, no, but that's part of why you need you know, you need one, the one you're using in a spare for what if or when something goes wrong. Yeah, so tell them what they cost. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> they cost about $250,000. Um, so that's a very expensive thing, right? This is not a toy. Um, but compare it to the cost of operating a ship. You know, we can operate a glider for about $100 or $200 a day in terms of its satellite cost, add a little bit more for personnel, because somebody's got to be answering the phone. Um, but the RV Savannah, the day rate for our ship is, you know, $13,000, $14,000 a day. So that comes with the best captain and crew in the UNAL's fleet and, you know, a capacious living space for scientists to be and all sorts of capabilities that gliders can't have. But, you know, as I'd mentioned before, gliders can be out when, this, when hurricanes are going on. You can't take that ship out all the time. So they're highly complimentary. And each mission, I should say, is about $50,000 for a 30-day mission, a 20 to 30-day mission. Did you have a question back there? Kind of, yeah. Okay. Um, how sensitive or specific are they um, up and down the coastline as far as, you know, when different types of ships are coming through based on salinity and temperature? I mean, you have to normalize all of that, don't you? In terms of figuring out, like, the gliders the and getting them ready? or Oh, oh okay. Yeah. yeah, so the whales fall into a pretty specific okay. uh, range. And that's what the library is. It has that, this is the call of the right whale, and this is the sound that it makes when it's doing this. Gotcha. Um, what's interesting, though, is that there's some evidence that, um, that right whales don't, they can silence themselves. And there are some real reasons you could think of why they might hush up for a few minutes while something else might be happening. Um, and so part of what we rely on here is, is, um, is waiting for a whale to say something, right? And just because we don't hear anything doesn't mean that the whale isn't there. It can be quiet and we don't hear it because it's not saying, it's not making any calls. So um, one thing that, one common question I get is, well, this is great. You've got a glider out and if you don't hear any whales, then we can go as fast as we want, right? 
No. <laughs> no, unfortunately, that's not the way it works. You only have your ability. You only can hear calls when it's making. But just because you don't detect a signal doesn't mean that there's not an animal there. Are there any other questions for Catherine this evening? But if not, let's thank her again for the Have great questions. And we look forward to seeing you on May 9th. <laughs>